In the 20th century, the United States found itself embroiled in one of the longest conflicts that the country had ever seen. Beginning with the Korean War in 1950 and ending in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Cold War would shape the direction and character of the American political scene. The increasing socialist influence in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Eastern Europe put a lot of pressure on politicians in America to adjust to the rising influence of socialism on the world stage. This shift can be seen in both political parties and the direction of American politics as a whole. So far, we've talked mostly about the New Deal consensus, which ruled American politics for much of the 20th century. That is to say that the policy of the US government became to spend big on public services and social safety nets for much of this time. Of course, that was maintained in large part due to our pillaging of small third world countries that had tried to become socialist, but still, unions were strong, the government was helping people, and civil rights in this country were rapidly improving. This New Deal consensus, though, began to crumble in the tail end of the 1960s. According to Robert Reich in his book Supercapitalism, the space age brought us many advances in technology. Technology which would later be adopted by the private sector, leading to increased access to technology at cheaper prices. As technology became more affordable, more and more people could purchase that technology for production and use. This led to more firms entering the marketplace, increasing competition. As profits became more and more difficult to extract due to competition, suddenly businesses needed to cut some of the burden of taxation and regulation in order to extract enough surplus value to survive in an ever more competitive marketplace. This meant businesses needed to lobby the government in order to cut some of the existing regulations and social programs from the past 40 years since the Depression. Thus, the business world, the people who control all of politics in this country, began to take a more active role in elections, leading to our country shifting from the New Deal consensus in our politics to the neoliberal consensus. The beginning of this shift can be seen in the presidency of Richard Nixon. Mr. Nixon, what is the truth about our ability to fight the growing menace of communism? Well, first, we must recognize communism for what it is. Mr. Khrushchev understands only strength and firmness. To apologize to him just means weakness. Our next president must show clearly that America won't stand for being pushed around anywhere in the world. When Mr. Khrushchev says our grandchildren will live under communism, we must answer his grandchildren will live in freedom. When he says the Monroe Doctrine is dead, we say the doctrine of freedom applies everywhere in the world. The only answer to communism is a massive offensive for freedom. Nixon, elected in 1968, was a staunch anti-communist. Nixon would begin shifting the Republican Party's direction more towards its solid conservative stance that it's known for today. The Republican Party of Nixon, though, was not entirely conservative, and in fact was still constrained by America's New Deal consensus, though definitely increasingly right-wing. To show this contrast, Nixon oversaw a presidency which both created the Environmental Protection Agency and also started the war on drugs. So, Nixon also oversaw the end of the Vietnam War and easing of tensions with communist nations. Despite this, the CIA under Nixon would aid the overthrow of a democratically elected socialist in Chile, Salvador Allende, in September of 1973. Nixon would also oversee more and more liberalization, a trend which continues to this day. Nixon wasn't a truly transformational president for American politics in the Cold War, at least not as far as influencing the shift towards neoliberalism, which would happen later and neither was his successor, Gerald Ford. While both of these men were relatively unremarkable for our study, the presidency of Gerald Ford saw the emergence of someone who would change the direction of the party forever. Ronald Wilson Reagan.
coming onto the scene as a conservative presidential candidate in 1976, Ronald Reagan established himself as a strong opponent of communism, both by embracing economic policy, which benefited the rich, and by encouraging aggression against the communist world in order to give the rest of the world a good dose of American freedom and democracy. But we'll get back to him. Let's talk about the man who actually won the election that year. Jimmy Carter was elected as a Democratic president, though he was of a considerably different stripe from his predecessors since FDR. Not even the Democratic Party was safe from the shift towards neoliberalism. Carter, in fact, was perhaps one of the most disastrous presidents for America's working class since FDR began America's New Deal consensus. Carter's economic policies of union busting, tax cuts for the rich, and promotion of free trade made the old left, made of mostly low-skilled laborers from the Great Plains and Midwest, feel abandoned by the party which embraced them under the New Deal consensus. Ironically, feeling abandoned by the Democratic Party, many of these working class Americans would defect in the 1980 election in which Carter faced off with Ronald Reagan, the unabashed conservative from before. After the decay of New Deal policies under the administrations of Nixon, Ford, and finally Carter, Ronald Reagan would officially usher in the neoliberal era in America. 